When the stealth genre is discussed, three juggernauts usually get brought up. Metal Gear Solid for its captivating story, memorable characters, and fun gameplay. Splinter Cell for its commitment to realism, gadgets, and the main character. Hitman for its massive amount of variability and replay to its levels along with its interesting world. But there's another series that helped to usher in the stealth action genre with great gameplay, levels, soundtrack, and heroes. The Siphon Filter franchise is underrated and deserves more attention. This was made by Sony Ben before they were even known by that name. Back then, they were known as Eidetic, and while their first game on the PlayStation was a flop, it oddly enough opened the door to truly let these talented developers show their craft to the world. They were flying blind as they were working to create a game for a genre that was just starting to emerge. These developers showed creativity within the limitations of their hardware to deliver a cinematic experience, while providing genre-defining gameplay. Join me as we take a look back at Siphon Filter. Eidetic started out as a team of about eight people and tried to make their mark on the games industry through a very early attempt at a 3D platformer. Their first game to ever release was a 3D version of the Bubsy series. This was going to be made for Sony's PlayStation. This generation was able to provide more games in 3D, and the developers felt that this was a good time to try this out for a platformer. While they had good intentions with their game, Bubsy 3D ended up being a flop. It lagged behind its contemporaries and even some within the studio felt that Naughty Dog's Crash Bandicoot did what Eidetic tried to do, but a lot better. While this game was a commercial and financial failure, it wasn't all bad for the studio. Oddly enough, developing Bubsy for the PS1 opened the door to the start of an underrated franchise. With Bubsy 3D falling through, the studio was in a bit of a scramble to acquire another job to make a new game. As a means to gain attention for potential new projects, the developers made a prototype for Bubsy 4D to show off what their engine could do. This prototype caught the eye of Sony and they saw the potential in Eidetic, and liked that they had experience with developing a game on their platform. So Sony came to their studio with an offer. Sony had seen the success with GoldenEye and the N64, and wanted to have an action espionage game on their platform, and they had an idea for a game but no developer to make it. Sony then provided Eidetic with a name and a synopsis. The synopsis did not contain any story elements nor names of characters. What was included included were ideas for the game's setting along with potential gameplay options, and the name that was provided was Siphon Filter. Eidetic hired on five more employees to get to work on their new game. Siphon Filter was intended to be a stealth action game which would focus on gadgets, weapons, and options for stealth. Ultimately, the developers wanted the player to feel like a super spy. Eidetic even looked to Goldeneye for inspiration in this area, since that game was hugely successful and tackled a similar genre. But even with Goldeneye for inspiration, there were not many other games of this genre at the time, so in many ways, this studio was flying a bit blind. This meant that they had a lot of freedom in how they tackled their game, but at the same time, that also meant that they had a lot of pressure to really nail this rising genre. With the team wanting this to be a spy fantasy, they made it clear very early on that this was going to have a more grounded-like feel to it rather than leaning into science fiction. This would involve the player hunting down terrorists and stopping their plans. As I mentioned before, Goldeneye was a large influence on the game, and so was Tomb Raider from a gameplay standpoint. At the time, Goldeneye was a successful first-person shooter, but it implemented a lot of different objectives like rescuing hostages and defusing bombs, where many shooters at the time focused on key hunting for their objectives. The objective aspect of Goldeneye is what the developers wanted to implement into their identity as well. One of the developers saw this as an opportunity to improve on this feature within Siphon Filter. For example, in Goldeneye, if the player died, they would need to restart start the entire level over again, and in some cases repeating some of those objectives. Siphon Filter would allow for checkpoints after completing each objective. In addition to this, Siphon Filter's levels would not outright illustrate all of the objectives at the start of the level. As the player explored the level, there would be unknown and new objectives that would pop up, that would either build off the main objective or be entirely new. The goal was to provide an element of surprise to the player for each of the levels. The developers saw this as a bit of an evolution on what Goldeneye 
I had established. With Tomb Raider, the third-person shooting featured an auto-aim for the combat, but Tomb Raider would not allow for a more refined lock-on mechanic along with the precision of first-person aiming. As such, the developers again saw what was established in another game and found a way to implement it into theirs. And this is where the aiming options for Siphon Filter were born. They went a bit further as well with this as they tried to work within the limitations of the PlayStation. Their engine on the PS1 would only ever allow for five enemies to be on screen at once. The developers wanted the player to feel like they were continuously encountering an onslaught of enemies. As a means to provide this, the game would spawn enemies in front and in the back of the player. This would provide that onslaught-like feeling and have many opportunities to provide a cinematic camera-like sweeping movements as the player would use the auto-aim to target someone who was right behind them. Essentially, the developers found themselves being creative within the limitations. A small but unique aspect of Siphon Filter's identity would be found within the first game as well. While developing the combat, the team wanted to have a weapon that the player could use if they completely ran out of ammo. They tried working with a knife, but couldn't get the mechanics of it to work as they intended. This is where the taser came into play, and the developers found this item to work much better than ever using the knife, and it oddly enough became iconic to the series. While developing the taser, the team applied a smoke effect to the enemy that is being tased, and fire would indicate that the enemy is now dead. The one problem with the use of the taser was how the camera would still stay behind Gabe. So they toyed around with moving the camera closer to the enemy to really capture this action. So the knife ended up being one of the few things that was actually cut from the final game. One of the lead designers was a big fan of John Woo films, which factored into how the lock-on camera worked. But he also worked to have a form of dual wielding with weapons in there, but this was eventually cut from the game. At one time, there was even no health bar. Siphon Filter operated on a system where if you took one shot, you were dead. The idea was to keep the tension very high high, but through collaboration with the rest of the studio, they found this to be too unforgiving for the player. And this is where Siphon Filter adopted a more traditional health and armor system. Early on, the team knew that they wanted to have the story play a big part in the game. They felt the best way to present the story was through cutscenes. Siphon Filter did not have the largest budget, and while the potential cutscenes would not be of the highest quality, they felt that having these lower budget cutscenes were better than not having them to tell their story. With a general idea of where they wanted to go, with this game. A lot of the development really came down to the developers experimenting and sort of developing on the fly to see what would work in their game. One thing that the developers wanted to have in their cutscenes were characters having faces with mouths that moved along with eyes that blinked. They felt that this would add more realism to the scenes. They worked with the limitations to deliver this within the presentation. Along with this, the developers wanted to provide more storytelling and continuous narrative to the player. This resulted in each of the levels having having short text briefings at the start of each stage. They also incorporated radio calls where the player could opt to call Leon to get more information or get informed on a new objective. These were optional calls that were not forced upon the player, allowing you to skip them when replaying the game. These are examples of the developer trying to work within their limitations to deliver their vision on a smaller budget. The story went through several changes before making it an action thriller set in present day. One iteration of the story was set in a post-apocalyptic setting where the player would try to rebuild mankind. There would be these siphons that provided energy and some people had the ability to filter this energy into a usable way to help rebuild. So in this version, the player would actually be a siphon filter. Another story concept was about a group of scientists who had been kidnapped and were kept in an underground area. It was here that they would be forced to build a time machine by an evil group. Through collaboration with different members of the studio, the story was rewritten and the phrase siphon filter would be a code word for a deadly programmable virus. While this type of story setup was used in other mediums, this would be a new concept for a video game story. Through Siphon Filter's development, the project went through some rough times. The developers have stated that they missed a few deadlines, which caused stress on the team and even ran the risk of the project being outright canceled. This was due to the studio improving mechanics, changing the order of levels, and making changes 
business to the narrative. Thankfully, their producers saw the potential in this studio and backed them up throughout the process. Sony had faith in this new upcoming spy genre and felt that the developer could deliver something good. Through playtesting, the developers ended up shifting the order of some of the levels to provide better flow to the action and locations. For example, the lead designer wanted to move the park level, which was originally supposed to be towards the end of the game, to have it come a lot earlier following the subway level. This adjustment was made for the flow of the gameplay along with the betterment of the entire project. As such, the script and story needed to be tweaked to fit that change. The developers were very focused on telling an interesting story, but when it came down to it, gameplay was the top priority, and this was an example of that decision. Boss fights were even changed during the development. The Gurdu boss fight was originally going to take place in a parking lot. The team found this to be really hard to do in concept since they wanted the boss fight to be set within a smaller arena, and with the level being in a parking lot, the developers struggled to come up with a natural way to fence in the player. This is where one of the developers came up with setting the fight in a closed-in space and a ringed-in wall. This wasn't the only change to the fight as well. During the later stages of development, Metal Gear Solid was released on the PS1. This was a sequel to the established franchise, and this would be the first entry on Sony's PlayStation. Eidetic noticed some similarities between Metal Gear Solid and Siphon Filter. For example, some of the boss fights looked very similar, like both games featuring a helicopter fight, along with a fight with a large man who wielded a Gatling gun. Gurdu originally used a Gatling gun, and with the similarities to Metal Gear Solid, the developers opted to change this weapon to a flamethrower for their game, to avoid any notion that Siphon Filter copied Metal Gear Solid. Siphon Filter's development is about a studio receiving a second chance to really show what they were capable of. With the team about the size of a small indie development studio, they were given the keys to make a spy action thriller. The developers used the limitations of the hardware of the PS1 to their advantage to be creative and achieve their vision. They were flying a bit blind throughout the project and were not afraid to rework, change, and improve many aspects of their game to make a better overall experience. In February 1999, Siphon Filter was released to the world. Siphon Filter is both a very hard and compelling game. The game's narrative hooks you right away with captivating cutscenes centered around an action thriller plot. The characters are interesting and while development is light, they remain likable with their voice actors generally doing a good job. Our main hero instantly has an iconic voice along with really making Gabe come alive. The cutscenes are short and to the point, providing us with what we need to know and quickly getting the player back into the action. And while there are some dated aspects about the gameplay, Siphon Filter is an engaging experience that challenges the player, along with providing some good problem solving. The action is generally solid whether you are engaging in some run and gun action, being more tactical, or trying a stealthy approach. Siphon Filter is a third-person stealth action game. Gabe has a few options for movement. You can roll to evade enemy fire along with being able to climb. There is a crouch button to allow for more control and slower movement for stealth. When it comes to shooting, you have two options. You can opt to use either the lock-on aiming or the manual aim. The lock-on will snap to the closest enemy and if you hit the button again, you will then target a new foe. You are given a bar on how likely you are to hit your target. This helps to know if you need to get to a better position to have a better chance at landing your hits. Most of the time the lock-on can be used to take out your enemies, but this will not work if your foes have body armor on. These enemies can be killed with certain weapons that will pierce the armor or you need to land a headshot. This is where the manual aim comes into play. You can use this to aim at any point on the enemy's body, but you will mainly use this for headshots and hard to hit targets. The first person aiming also provides you with more tactical options. A good example of this is how you can lean while in the first person view. This can allow you to hide behind some cover and then poke your head out for some quick shots. It is important to note that you cannot walk while in first person. The lock-on and manual aiming are both appreciated as it provides more options to the player during the combat situations. There is a little bit of a trade-off with this since it isn't the smoothest of transitions while using these, especially when you quickly need to go into first person aiming during a fight. This is an example of some of the dated aspects of this game. While not necessarily bad, you will just need to account for this when in 
engaging with enemies and understand that this isn't the snappiest of aiming systems. Your health system is centered around collecting more armor. You start the stage with a full bar of health and armor. You can collect more armor while in the level, either through defeated enemies or from crates, but you cannot refill your health. The damage system is pretty interesting as well since there is a bar that indicates if the player is in danger. If this is full, you will take damage from enemies. Rolling and hiding behind cover can decrease this bar, allowing you some more wiggle room. The shooting itself is really good. The good sound effects paired with good impact makes the shooting satisfying. The enemies have some pretty good death animations with some weapons causing some nice knockback to them. This also shows off some of the impressive attention to detail for its time. I really like how the blood will remain on the clothes of an enemy after you shoot them, along with being able to shoot out some objects in the environments like lights. Small details like this enhances the action and makes it more intense. You get a nice variety of different weapons to use, from pistols, machine guns, shotguns, the awesome taser, and many more. The taser is one of my favorites, as it provides a lot of comedy and you can even light enemies on fire. Damn it! Before we discuss some of the other areas of the game, I want to discuss the first mission. It is rare for a game to hit the ground running and start off so strong, and when it happens, I like to take the time to praise it. Before we get into any of the gameplay, the story starts, and to the writer's credit, there is no slow buildup. We are thrown right into the action, and none of it feels jarring. We know who our two protagonists are and what they are trying to do. We get more context as it continues on, but I really want to commend how the story is really focused on not wasting the player's time. These initial cutscenes are effective. Once we get to actually play the game, the design, gameplay, and presentation is where the game shines as well. One thing that I really enjoyed was how the level provides you with your general set of objectives. As you continue throughout the level, and in some cases explore, you will get alerted to another objective you need to complete. These are all set objectives for the level, but when you initially go in, you do not know what all of your objectives are and what you need to complete. So when you encounter a new area of the level and they provide you with another task, this feels more player initiated rather than just having a list of things to do within each stage. Essentially, the developers did a good job of masking these objectives and making the player feel more involved with them. It is a simple and creative way to implement more player discovery into the game. Along with this, this level and the game does not hold your hand. You will know what your objective is, but the game isn't going to give you a play-by-play -play on how to complete it. This is where some of the problem solving comes into play. Even in this first level, there are a few different paths that you can take. Along you to complete some of the objectives in a different order depending on how you tackle the level. Another nice surprise was how there was some hidden items that you could find. I was in an alley and saw that there was a crate above me. I found a way to get up there and was rewarded with a weapon. Do not expect these very involving multi-step puzzles, but rather these small and well-executed things providing the player with these aha-like moments when they wonder if they can do something and it actually results in something rewarding to the player. Plus the different areas of the level provides it with a lot of character where this feels like you were fighting in an actual city. You fight in a few buildings and alleys along with down in the subway with active trams going by. And this is all presented within the first level. The story hooks you and so does the gameplay. The problem solving in player discovery is an area that I think Siphon Filter does very well. This game's approach provides just enough guidance to the player so they know what they need to do, but the game is relatively hands-off when it comes to completing it. Or the game provides small clues to allow for the player to figure out the small puzzle-like situation. This is seen in the second level where you need to blow open a gate to allow for the bomb squad member to come in, but you need to find the explosives. Through some exploration and using your flashlight you will find them and then you can proceed. I appreciate how it shows that even your non-combat tools will provide you with meaningful assistance in these levels. There is a part that happens a few missions in that is a great example of this design. There is a part where you need to use an elevator to go up, but every time you use the elevator it only goes down. To provide you with a clue, there is a switch up top that has malfunctioned and you can see and hear the sparks. After searching around for another means to get up top, I wanted to try shooting the switch to see if that would cause the elevator to go up and it ended up working. This was really rewarding along with being a cool moment where the game makes you feel like a secret agent improvising on the fly. It is moments like this that makes this game extra special.
Siphon Filter really treats the player with respect and like an adult. This even comes down into looking at your inventory. This is where you can find out if a weapon will pierce through an enemy's body armor. Along with this, I love the variety in different locations and objectives throughout the campaign. There's a nice mixture between set piece like levels and ones that allow for more exploration. I really enjoyed the level where you need to chase down an enemy in a subway while the trains are moving past you. So you need to catch up with a terrorist, contend with her henchmen, and dodge the trains. Following this, there is a level set within a park at night during the rain and you need to find bombs to disarm. The night and rain allows for a good atmosphere and you need to contend with this impaired vision. This is one of the few stages with a time limit and you really learn how valuable your map is in this level, since you can easily get turned around in it. There are a few missions where it operates with the design of quiet in and loud out kind of gameplay. You need to follow someone at a party and take out their security to get close to them. This forces you to play with patience and find the best timing to land your headshots. After this, the level transitions into more direct action set of events, and with this being in a museum, this one level allows for a lot of different environments. The developers deserve a lot of praise here since they really use what this location could provide in terms of variety to the player. One of my favorite levels is a winter-like area in an enemy base. This is mostly a stealth-focused mission, in that if you alert any of the guards, you will need to contend with a lot of enemies, making it really tough to complete. But this level is a great example of slow and steady means you will succeed. The action combined with the setting makes this one of the most memorable levels within the game. As a stealth mission, it's really tough and exhilarating. The wealth of variety in these locations is really impressive. Some of the later stages showcase fighting on and inside a cathedral, along with one level where you have two factions at war with each other and you get caught in the middle. It is important to note that none of these levels are a cakewalk either, and the game gets harder and harder as you keep going. And there's some pretty good boss fights as well. Two of my favorites are fighting Gurdu and the helicopter. When you encounter the flamethrower, you cannot damage this enemy from the front. You need to hit his backpack to cause it to explode. The only way to do this is to manually aim at him. The trade-off is is that he can kill you in one hit, so you need to use the pillars for cover and chip away at him until it explodes. For the helicopter, you are in a small area and need to fight enemy reinforcements along with this big gunship. You need to get creative as there is not a lot of cover here. These two boss fights are among my two favorite parts in this game. I'm on my way to the park. Have Benton send a team to pick up Mara Aramov. I left her wounded and unconscious in the Fifth Avenue tunnel. But chances are she's already on the move. Copy. And if he hasn't alerted FEMA, he better do it soon. Romer is going to trigger the main viral device whether or not the government meets his demands. I'm already on it. I do want to praise the story as well. Like I said before, the narrative doesn't waste any of your time and hits the ground running with its story. It is immediately interesting and pulls the player in. Gabe and Leon are two characters that I grew an attachment for throughout the game. While they do not have much in the way of character development, their partnership is solid and their voice actors do a good job with the script. Gabe's voice actor deserves a lot of credit as he really brings this character to life and instantly cements Gabe with this iconic voice. There are also some nice moments of Gabe being an action hero and you can't help but love them. The story presents enough mystery to keep you interested along with our heroes. There's a lot of twists and turns within the narrative and it effectively sells this action thriller setting. The story and the gameplay work well together to create this compelling experience. I really enjoyed Siphon Filter a lot and it has many aspects about it that feel timeless, but there are a few flaws as well. While not necessarily a flaw, I feel like it's important to mention the difficulty again. This game is really hard and there are some aspects that feel downright cheap, but the game does require the mindset of being patient and persistent. One of my biggest issues with the game is how you are detected in the stealth focus levels. There are two levels where you need to follow someone and take out the guards. If any of the guards spot you, then the entire place knows where you are and you fail the mission. This feels really unfair and does not provide much in any way of wiggle room for error. I think if an enemy who spotted you had to call it in or set off an alarm, this could give you some time to react and take out the enemy before they did that. While not often, enemies will use grenades and the blast radius is just a little bit too big which can cause some frustrating deaths. I also found the general movement to be a bit clunky and not as precise as I wanted it to be. Much of this gets better as you keep playing the game and get used to the movement. Towards the end of the game the amount of enemies with body armor can be a bit much with almost everyone requiring to be killed with a headshot and since it takes some time to go into manual aim and then line up that headshot you can feel like you are needlessly taking damage. There are aspects about siphon filter that do annoy me and can 
hinder parts of my playthrough, but this game has so many aspects about it that make it so special. If this game received a remaster or visual remake, I would refine some of the dated areas since at its core there is so much that this game does right. Before we move to the conclusion, I want to highlight the excellent soundtrack. This is a game where the entire soundtrack is filled with awesome songs. Here are a few tracks from the game. Siphon Filter for the PS1 is a criminally underrated game. The development showed how a developer can successfully emerge from a flop and work to start a beloved franchise. The team was smart in how they persisted through their failure by trying to show what their engine could do on the PlayStation. That prototype opened the door to them leading a project that would be named Siphon Filter. This was a studio hungry for work and loved what they did and had the talent to make something special. During the development of Siphon Filter, the studio used the limitations of the PlayStation Station as a means to be creative and get the most out of that space. This resulted in providing a game that was a compelling stealth action experience, along with providing a narrative that sucked the players in. From a gameplay side of things, I really enjoyed how the levels and objectives were designed. The levels were mostly linear, but the way the objectives were added to the player disguised the linearity and made them feel more like they were discovered by the player. The gameplay mostly revolved around shooting, using cover, and opting for sneakier options, but there was plenty of special moments of problem solving. These moments were very immersive for the player and helped to sell that spy experience. One of my favorite moments like this in the game was when you needed to stop an enemy from killing someone, but you needed both of them alive, as they had different information that was useful to Gabe. The player can opt to use the taser to stun the enemy, or if the player so chooses, they can even shoot the gun right out of her hand, resulting in the same thing. The small element of choice for the problem is great and well done. Elements like this have aged very very well for Siphon Filter. The Siphon Filter series is criminally underrated, and this first game was one of the best games on the PS1, along with being one of the most important. This series helped to popularize the stealth action genre, and remains one of the PS1's best titles. Thank you very much for watching.